Chapter 7, My Dinner Goes Up in Smoke Word of the bathroom incident spread immediately. Wherever I went, campers pointed at me and murmured something about the toilet water. Or maybe they were just staring, staring at Annabeth, who was still pretty much dripping wet. She showed me a few more places. The metal shop, where kids were forging their own swords. The arts and crafts room, where satyrs were sandblasting a giant marble statue of a goat man. And the climbing wall, which actually consisted of two facing walls that shook violently. Dropped boulders, sprayed lava, and clashed together, if you didn't get to the top fast enough. Finally, we returned to the canoeing lake, where the trail led back to the cabins. I've got training to do, Annabeth said flatly. Dinner's at 7.30. Just follow your cabin to the mess hall. Annabeth, I'm sorry about the toilets. Whatever. It wasn't my fault. She looked at me skeptically, and I realized it was my fault. I'd made water shoot out of the bathroom fixtures. I didn't understand how, but the toilets had responded to me. I had become one with the plumbing. You need to talk to the Oracle, Annabeth said. Who? Not who, what? The Oracle, Alex Sharon. I stared into the lake, wishing somebody would give me a straight answer for once. I wasn't expecting anybody to be looking back at me from the bottom, so my heart skipped a beat when I noticed two teenage girls sitting, ac sitting cross-legged at the base of the pier, about 20 feet below. They wore blue jeans and shimmering green t-shirts, and their brown hair floated loose around their shoulders as minnows darted in and out. They smiled and waved as if I were a long-lost friend. I didn't know what else to do, so I waved back. Don't encourage them, Annabeth warned. Nayads are terrible flirts. Nayads? I repeated, feeling completely overwhelmed. That's it. I want to go home now. Annabeth frowned. Don't you get it, Percy? You are home. This is the only safe place on earth for kids like us. You mean mentally disturbed kids? I mean, not human. Not totally human, anyway. Half human. Half human and half what? I think you know. I didn't want to admit it, but I was afraid I did. I felt the tingling in my limbs, a sensation I sometimes felt when my mom talked about my dad. God, I said, half God. Annabeth nodded. Your father isn't dead, Percy. He's one of the Olympians. That's crazy. Is it? What's the most common thing gods did in the old stories? They ran around falling in love with humans and having kids with them. Do you think they've changed their habits in the last few millennia? But those are just, I almost said myths again. But then I remembered Sharon's warning that in 2000 years, I might be considered a myth. But if all the kids here are half gods, Demigods, Annabeth said, that's the official term, or half-bloods. Then, who's your dad? Her hand tightened around the pier railing. I got the feeling I'd just trespass on a sensitive subject. My dad is a professor at West Point, she said. I haven't seen him since I was very small. He teaches American history. He's human. What? You assume it has to be a male god who finds a human female attractive. How sexist is that? Who's your mom, then? Cabin six. Meaning... Annabeth straightened. Athena, god of wisdom, goddess of wisdom and battle. Okay, I thought, why not? And my dad? Undetermined, Annabeth said. Like I told you before, nobody knows, except my mother. She knew. Maybe not, Percy. Gods don't always reveal their identities. My dad would have. He loved her. Annabeth gave me a cautious look. She didn't want to burst my bubble. Maybe you're right. Maybe he'll send a sign. That's the only way to know for sure. Your father has to send you a sign claiming you as his son. Sometimes it happens. You mean sometimes it doesn't? Annabeth ran her palm along the rail. The gods are busy. They have a lot of kids and they don't always, well, sometimes they don't care about us, Percy. They ignore us. I thought about how some of the kids I'd seen in the Hermes, Hermes cabin, teenagers who looked sullen and depressed as if they were waiting for a call that would never come, I'd known kids like that at Yancey Academy shuffled off to boarding school by rich parents who didn't have the time to deal with them. But God should behave better. So I'm stuck here, I said. That's it? For the rest of my life? It depends, Annabeth said. Some campers only stay the summer. If you're a child of an Aphrodite or a Demeter, you're probably not a real powerful force. The monsters might ignore you. So you can get by with a few months of summer training and live in the mortal world for the rest of, live in the mortal world for the rest of the year. But for some of us, it's too dangerous to leave. We're year-rounders. In the mortal world, we attract monsters. They sense us. They come to challenge us. Most of the time, they'll ignore us until we're old enough to cause trouble, about 10 or 11 years old. But 
but after that, demigods either make their way here or they get killed off. A few manage to survive in the outside world and become famous. Believe me, if I told you the names, you'd know them. Some don't even realize they're demigods, but very, very few are like that. So monsters can't get in here? Annabeth shook her head. Not unless they're intentionally stocked in the woods or especially summoned by someone on the inside. Why would anybody want to summon a monster? Practice fights, practical jokes, practical jokes. The point is, borders are sealed to keep mortals and monsters out. From the outside, mortals look into the valley and see nothing unusual, just a strawberry farm. So you're a year rounder? Annabeth nodded. From under the collar of her t-shirt, she pulled a leather necklace with five clay beads of different colors. It was just like Luke's, except Annabeth's also had a big gold ring strung on it, like a college ring. I've been here since I was seven, she said. Every August on the last day of summer session, you get a bead for surviving another year. I've been here longer than most of the counselors, and they're all in college. Why did you come so young? She twisted the ring on her necklace. None of your business. Oh, I stood there for a minute in uncomfortable silence. So I could just walk out of here right now if I wanted to? It would be suicide, but you could. With Mr. D's or Miss, Mr. Sharon's permission, but they wouldn't give you permission until the end of the summer session, unless, unless you were granted a quest. But that hardly ever happens. The last time, her voice trailed off. I could tell from her tone that the last time hadn't gone well. Back in the sick room, I said, when you were feeding that stuff, ambrosia. Yeah, you asked me something about the summer solstice. Annabeth's shoulders tensed. So you know something? Well, no. Back in my old school, I overheard Grover and Sharon talking about it. Grover mentioned the summer solstice. He said something like we didn't have much time because of the deadline. What did that mean? She clenched her fists. I wish I knew Sharon and the satyrs, they know, but they won't tell me. Something is wrong in Olympus, something pretty major. Last time I was there, everything seemed so normal. You've been to Olympus? Some of us year-rounders, Luke and Clarice and I and a few others, we took a field trip during winter solstice, and that's when the gods have their big annual council. But how did you get there? The Long Island Railroad, of course. You get off at Penn Station, Empire State Building, special elevator to the 600th floor. She looked at me like she was sure. I must know this already. You are a New Yorker, right? Oh, sure. As far as I knew, there were only 102 floors in the Empire State Building, but I decided not to point that out. Right after we visited, Annabeth continued. The weather got weird as if the gods had started fighting. A couple of times since, I've overheard satyrs talking. The best I can figure out is that something important was stolen. And if it isn't returned by the summer solstice, there was going to be trouble. When you came, I was hoping, I mean, Athena can get along with just about anybody, except for Ares. And of course, she's got the rivalry with Poseidon. But I mean, aside from that, I thought we can work together. I thought you might know something. I shook my head. I wished I could help her, but I felt too hungry and tired and mentally overloaded to ask any more questions. I've got to get to the quest, Annabeth muttered to herself. I'm not too young. If they would just tell me the problem. I could, spell, I could smell barbecue smoke coming from somewhere nearby. Annabeth must have heard my stomach growl. She told me to go on. She'd catch me later. I left her on the pier, tracing her fingers across the rail as if, I, as if drawing a battle plan. Back at cabin 11, everybody was talking and horsing around, waiting for dinner. For the first time, I noticed that a lot of the campers had similar features. Sharp noses, upturned eyebrows, mischievous smiles. They were the kinds of kids that teachers would peg as troublemakers. Thankfully, nobody paid much attention to me as I walked over to my spot on the floor and plopped down with my minotaur horn. The counselor, Luke, came over. He had the Herms family resemblance, too. It was marred by that scar right on his cheek but his smile was intact. Found you a sleeping bag, he said, and here, I stole you some toiletries from the camp store. I couldn't tell if he was kidding about the stealing part. I said, thanks. No problem. Luke sat next to me, pushed his back against the wall. Tough first day? I don't belong here, I said. I don't even believe in gods. Yeah, he said, that's how we all started. Once you start believing in them, it doesn't get any easier. Easier. The bitterness in his voice surprised me because Luke seemed like a pretty easygoing guy. He looked like he could handle just about anything. So your dad is Hermes, I asked. 